Well, empiricism, as you know, is the information that has the possibility of being true comes from experience and or the senses. Now, the question is, how could, could logic, which is more fundamental, logic or you know, symbolic logic, a symbolic language, which we're going to examine today, or empiricism? Uh, I think empiricism is first. I've got good reasons for thinking that. And uh, but me, most philosophers, I think, don't. They think that logic uh, would be more fundamental. You know, because they, they would say, for example, <coughs> you know, a principle like this. 2 plus 2 equals 4 is self-evidently true and it becomes before sense experience. Um, but my response would be is to say, well, the only reason you ever knew to write this sentence down, the mathematical sentence, is because you saw things in the world. You saw two apples and another group of two apples, and when you put them together, they made four. Okay? So the only reason you need to utter these statements. But then they'll come back and say, well, the, uh, the nature of, you know, the properties of this set here go beyond your senses. doesn't matter if you thought to write it down or didn't think to write it down or whatever. It's, uh, it's true beyond uh, the physical world. In any universe that exists, in any reality, uh, this is a true statement. You know, this mathematical statement is self-evidently true. So, but see, that's an easy example. What about something that's more difficult? We'll see examples that are more difficult today that um, will make, will blur the line where you might think, well, empirical, you know, logical laws are one thing, but, um, you know, empiricism is more fundamental. A good example of that is quantum physics. Or, or you know, what, what are the real things? Things that are real in reality appear to be your mind. Man, this is a good throw. Um, your mind. Uh, much better. Much better. Um, and whatever it is that makes up, if there's something outside your mind, this is, a, this is a big statement right here. Your mind, you can verify, is real. Okay? You can directly experience it. Um, see, when you look out at the world, say you see these apples here, and you're, here you are, looking at, looking at the apples. Man. Um, I forgot that red one. Oh, there's that pen I was looking for. Um, okay, so you're looking... Oh yeah, look at that. That was good. You're looking at these apples, and um, but the experience happens in here in your brain. Okay, so your experience doesn't directly touch the apples. There's an intermediary there called you know eyes and light and um, you know the optic nerve uh, and so forth. Those are all things that are between your experience of the apple and the apple. Okay, so what if there's some mistakes that happen along the way here? Where, you know, this passage of information, the light to the eye, the eye processing, the eye to the optic nerve, the processing the brain, what if mistakes happen? And the apples don't really look like the apples you think they do, because somewhere here along the way, there were some mistakes. Um, well, it's very likely that that's what happened. Okay? That's why we see apples that are, um, you know, apples really aren't solid, but we experience them as solid. Okay, so, you see, your mind isn't like this. Your mind is, it's peculiar. Think if you're sitting in a closet, and, <laughs> um, okay, so here you are, you're sitting in a closet, you're saying, I'm um, doing meditation, as you know, um, okay, and, you're trying to look at your own consciousness. Alright? So, here's 
give your consciousness right here. And what happens is, is you have something that's doing the looking. This might have been done for you right here. There's the, the disinterested witness. Um, something, that's, something that's looking at the contents of consciousness. So you all can do this right now. You all can close your eyes and, and feel your feelings or see your thoughts or, or something. Okay, so notice, there, whatever is doing the looking, we use it called the mind's eye. Or, you know, that's in Western culture, we call it that. Looks right at the content. There's nothing in between, as far as we can tell. Here, there's all this stuff all between the experience and the object. Here, there's nothing in between the experience and the object. Okay? Um, so, therefore, you have no reason, if you can, if whatever you are, this, this thing right here, this system right here appears to be what you are. This is your self. Whatever the word self means. Okay? Your consciousness looking at the contents of consciousness. So, that's true over here too. If you're an experiencer, and you experience the apples, you're not experiencing the apples over here, you're experiencing the apples here. Okay? So, because a map has created your mind of what you think is over here. So, over here, the experience the, the experiencing thing, the mind's eye is looking at the apples. But, man, um, the, uh, <laughs> uh, so over here there's no, there's no intermediary between experience and the apples. But you don't know if this map of the apples created in your consciousness is what these are like. Okay? So that's the, hence that's the problem. So, but that doesn't happen over here. So, the evidence would appear to indicate to you that your consciousness directly witnesses uh, itself. Okay, so you don't have any reason to think it doesn't exist. Where here you do, you can have all kinds of, you can say, does the world even exist? I don't know, because I'm in here. Not there. I think I'm here. And then unless I think about it, I always think that, you know, the outside world is real. But I've, I've never existed in it, I only exist in here. So who knows what's going on over here. I could actually be in a bathtub somewhere, you know, eight light years away from this, this place, um, you know, dreaming this experience. So, like the Matrix, Neo, right, he was in the bathtub, or whatever that egg pod thing was. Um, so, so anyway, I don't know how we got on this, but let me keep going, this is a good topic. So you, your mind appears to be something you can confidently think is real. Let's just call, for, for simplicity, in a hundred level class, let's just call the mind, you know, yourself, part of yourself. Not really clear that that's the case, but let's just do that for simplicity. Now, what else is real in reality? There's only one other possibility. This will this sound a lot like Indian Dharma Kirti or Jignyaga. So a lot, of, a lot of Indian Buddhists were concerned with kind of what I'm talking about right here. Um, so what else could exist? The only other possibility of stuff that could exist outside of your mind is stuff outside of your mind. What is outside of your, this is real philosophy here, we're talking about. This is the big stuff, okay? Good. Yeah, let me try the green one. See, the green one never erases, right? Um, so those are the only two possibilities I know. So that can include anything, God, physical stuff, whatever, but it appears both science and philosophy have shown that anything that exists outside of your mind can only be particles, kind of like the ones quantum physicists have discovered. Why is that? Because things like solidity, um, time, motion, you know, all this stuff is only describable by contradictions, as we discussed. Remember the moving, the glowing bowl last time? It's actually still. There is no motion. Okay. Motion is a stillness. Um, motion is a there. There's only stillness. Still things after each other, one after the other. Solidity. How can you have um, energy points that have no size or solidity create solidity like this desk? You can't. So solidity is gone. If motion is not there, time is gone, etc. We've already done this before in the semester. So the point is that all you can have outside of your consciousness, no matter what you think you see, are points really spiritual because they're not physical so they're, they're sort of more like spiritual stuff um, 
spiritual point atoms. Okay? So that's the only two possible things that can exist in a series. And that's interestingly, it's interesting that, you know, Buddhists in the, uh, in pre-classical India discovered this. And then later, in the 1920s, 1930s, and 40s, quantum physicists in the Western world sort of found out that, yeah, um, if we look at matter, we don't find solidity, time, and motion. Okay? Uh, we just find these pieces of point energy, points of energy that flip, flip around and don't obey logical laws. They don't obey material laws. So, the two things that exist, your consciousness, not physical, as we've discussed. Particles, they don't have physical properties either. So, there isn't anything physical that exists. You may think there is, and it sure feels like it, like when I feel this board. But that's just a product of your uh, mental processes, okay? And it doesn't stand up to science, which if you, if you take this board here and dissect it into little pieces, it won't look like a board meeting. It won't have solidity and materiality. So, the point of all this was uh, to say how then can logic, symbolic logic stand up? This is why I'm an empiricist, not a, and I hold that empiricism is more fundamental than symbolic logic. Because, what does symbolic logic have to say about this? Nothing. Symbolic logic is a language about the material world. Okay? But the material world is the very thing we're having trouble verifying exists. In the ordinary state of consciousness, sure, it seems to be there. But the ordinary state of consciousness is the one that lies, the one that's filled with mistakes. It's the one that thinks that the, the clock hand and that clock is still. It's the one that thinks that um, uh, the piece of paper, your piece of paper is smooth and white, or smooth and yellow in the case of today's paper. But it's not. All you need is a magnifier, and you find out that paper is not smooth and only some of it's white or yellow. Okay? You know, you look at the green leaf, it looks like solid greenness. You magnify it down to the cell, and there is no green, there's hardly any greenness there. Anybody ever looked at a leaf and a magnifier, a biology class or something? I mean, the greenness is like little dots here and there. I mean, the, the leaf isn't green at that perspective. It's got some dots here and there that are green, but it's mostly transparent. So the idea then is that your, the empirical, your ordinary empirical view is lying to you. We need a higher sense of empiricism. And I think that Buddhists in India, along with quantum physicists more recently, have discovered it actually. So, so that's my problem with symbolic logic. But, um, I don't know, so we'll have to see though how this works, if we can make it stand up to quantum physicists and so forth. So there's another philosophy here called rationalism. The information that has the possibility of being true comes from your mental capacities. So you, you say, it doesn't matter what the world says necessarily. If I'm going to find uh, things that are true, to put this as simply as possible, if I'm going to find anything that's true, I have to look, my mind will figure it out, not my senses. Uh, so logic is more in that direction a little bit. And most philosophers through history, I think, have been more in that direction. Now, there's a third category here, which, let me look up for you here. There we go. Uh, positivism. It basically says that the scientific method, the method is the best approach to understanding the physical world. Uh, or I would, I would expand that and say the best approach for understanding anything. Okay? So not only do you just take, see, that we've already discussed that when we've had the hypothesis part of the class. Not only is it, we don't need just um, empiricism, because a lot of our empirical views are wrong. We need a method, a, a, you know, in that perspective, in the empirical perspective. You know, the, the perspective where we say, okay, the only things that I know that might be true are things that I can experience. So, but within that, you need a method, and that's the scientific method, okay, where you, um, and that's a, that's a big story right here. But being a scientist means that you attack your own ideas. And there's all kinds of things involved with it. So positive, positivism is sort of like um, saying only things that can stand up to um, the type of empiricism that science is supposed to be designed for, only those can possibly be real. Saying 
in that um, scheme of empiricism. So, okay, so what? how do we create the artificial language? Uh, we need the elements of a new language, and then we want to put them together, and then after that we want to find inferences with them. Okay? And that's what we have to do next. Um, and some of the examples in the book are not real thrilling, so I've got some good ones that we'll do on our own as well. Um, so on page 122, let me show you these symbols here. Um, okay. Um, okay, so when we study statements this semester, we're going to call those letters of the alphabet, capital letters, A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I, J, K, M, L, P, Q, R, S, Z. All right. Um, then we have operations between the statements that we can do. So, for example, if you have one statement that is, says something like, um, call one A, call another statement B, and let's say A is um, matter does not exist. Uh, Mark, matter does not exist. I'm just making this up off the cuff, following what we just got done discussing with quantum physics. Um, and I don't know, let's take something else we just talked about. Uh, mind is verifiable to exist. So if we said A and B, so it looks like a little dot here is conjunction. That means we call it and. Not multiplication, it's not A times B, like in your algebra class. Um, a and B. So matter that would A and B would be matter does not exist and the mind is verifiable. Okay? So uh, a lot of you are like yawn, but you know, this is supposed to be exciting. But wow, I can say all that and just go A and B. You know, that's supposed to be what is involved. Um, so if you're a computer operator or something, yeah, this can be handy. Or if you're, I mean, if you, when you get into a discipline in your life, say you become a physicist or a lawyer or a police officer or something, people have their little abbreviations. You know, like what's a, got a 187? Is that murder if you're a police officer? Um, yeah, I mean, so instead of saying, June, we have a murder here, and, you know, it's quicker to just say 187, like that. So, um, this is, I mean, we do this in our lives. Who's seen Twin Peaks? Everybody seen Twin Peaks? I remember they had the secret society. Uh, they called themselves the, the Bunkhouse Boys or something. <laughs> it's been a couple years since I've seen it. But, uh, you know, they develop their own codes and, and way, you know, they have little hand signals and so forth. You know, it's just a way to uh, be more efficient in life. Um, and uh, so this kind of idea is something that's innate to humans. We do this. Uh, I mean, even religion. I mean, you, if you have a religion, like an American Indian religion, there's, you know, the, the snake is a very widely used creature that you find in rock art and so forth. So now, what does the snake mean? Well, that takes a whole book to write, and even the book may not get you to what it really means. You may even have to have a religious experience to understand what they mean by the snake, you know, what the snake is supposed to involve. Um, so, do they write all that, sit there and talk about it all? Maybe, to a degree, but, or they can just, you know, um, here, let me write on that. Another thing. Uh, what I should have been doing all along. Or they can just go like this. Show a snake eating its own tail. Okay? So that might be more efficient. So they can encapsulate, you know, say some American Indian uh, shaman has done, you know, 20 years of religious work, and this, you know, they have some experience which they symbolize by a snake, to put it real crudely. See, that's real efficient then. Okay? Real efficient. I mean, we're talking about major. Um, studying so forth just encapsulated by one symbol. So people who are experts in the field will know each other by the symbol. Remember in the Bible, remember the fish? Um, uh, 
look like this or something. Um, I'm not real good at this topic, but if I recall, you know, that people would communicate to each other with that symbol. So all kinds of incredible information, huge amounts of information, is encapsulated in just one little symbol that people could write on the ground in a, with their foot. So if, the, if you walk up to a stranger and you want to know if they're on your team, you know, you can just sit there and say, yeah, hey, Bert, how you doing today? And draw the fish symbol with your feet in the dirt. And then Bert, who you're talking to, back there in 580 or 200 or BC or whatever, um, will say, ah, now we know we're on the same team. Okay? Because a symbol is, that's how powerful. Language is just not as efficient as, as what we're doing here. You know, I mean, look at, I mean, so we've got, I mean, the more experience you can pack into a symbol, the more information you can pack into a symbol, the more efficient language gets. And so we're talking about real big efficient stuff here. Now, I mean, let's take a scientific example. In physics, um, uh, I don't know. I could go, uh, I could go like this, rho. Okay, anybody taking physics? I'm a little rusty in their physics. I could, I could go like this, and that equals momentum. But I didn't need to write that down. If you were in that field and you knew what rho meant, you know that momentum equals, uh, you know, that, that's the momentum, momentum, and that actually is mass times velocity. You don't have to explain what mass is, you don't have to explain what velocity is, you don't have to explain what any of this, you just put up row and everybody knows what you're talking about. Okay, like the same thing with, uh, if I go like this, GMM over R squared. That's gravitational, that's the equation for gravitation, Newton's gravitation. Okay, it's an equation, but it's kind of used like as a package symbol. Like this is one symbol. Um, and that holds unbelievable amounts of information. Uh, that if you're in the discipline, we can talk to each other in the same wavelength, like about that. Yeah? Do you think it's possible that um, much of the misreading, for example, of uh, symbols and religion is people not being clued into what the symbology of that particular discipline is, and they're yeah. trying to filter it through their own system or something that they make up? Well, the way? you know this better than anybody because your expertise is Eastern religion, <laughs> and you see all these clowns who haven't been in the monastery for 10 years, who haven't gone on the, you know, you know, the Brahmanic pilgrimage for themselves, and then they try to write an intellectual book on a topic, which is not, it, it's a couple symbols are supposed to symbolize religious experience, which is beyond language. So, I mean, yeah, you see that your discipline shows us more than any discipline, you know? So yeah, that's the whole problem. I mean, and that's why you get these big fights in physics and stuff. Like, I've been doing some work on this, actually, ironically, with just some stuff in um, other parts of my life. And uh, you get online and try to start talking to people about it, and you find out that a lot of people that say, oh, I know a lot about this, don't know really what... I mean, say you're going to find the gravitation between two bodies. I'm finding the wrong information comes from here in the mind. So, um, it's kind of tricky though, because really all your information is only in the mind. You know, because like the mind's eye views its content. That's all you've ever done in your whole life. Your mind's eye views the content of your mind. So you're stuck in here thinking you're out here. But the thing is though, is there's two kinds of mental content. There's, here's your, so we're inside your, let's draw a diagram of your mind. There's this cool thing called the mind's eye, which just has one job. It looks at the other contents of the mind, strangely. Um, a lot of Hindu philosophers have been really concerned with this interesting, interesting issue. So it sees two kinds of um, info, empirical and non-empirical. Okay? So... So in your mind, there's certain experiences that you view in your mind that are called empirical, like pen. Okay? You all experience this pen in your mind now, but you believe it's out here in the world, so it's an empirical experience. And then there's all the other ones. This is where the weapons of mass destruction are. Non-empirical ideas. You know, things that can't be verified, you haven't seen, you don't have experience for. They're just ideas or mathematical formulations or something. Okay? So 
Um, so these contents are the ones that have reliability. Uh, anybody have any questions? Mm -hmm. Well, we have feelings about things. It's hard to tell what meaning is. You know, I mean, I have feelings about certain things. You know, I feel like I've got some books there. I feel really good about those, and I used to talk about George Bush. I feel really bad about that. <laughs> so, are, that, are those feelings what meanings are? I don't know. If, if not, then I don't really know what meanings are. It's almost like there's meaninglessness. It's almost like meaning reduces the feeling. I'm not sure. But if, but if you try to define meaning, you know, you say what's important to a culture or something like that, then that reduces the feeling. Um, so, but anyways, uh, it seems to me, I mean, if nobody can verify what's out in the world, and it's always a picture show up in your head, then yeah, the human, human life, at least in our normal, ordinary, waking life, not, you know, you know, hallucinatory loosen state, you've taken a DMT or something, maybe different kinds of consciousness happen there, or a religious experience, like St. Paul, the Road to Damascus, or Buddha. Maybe they're having different orders. You know, so forget all those. The ordinary, the bad one, the bad city consciousness, where you're bored and everything's horrible. Um, that one seems to be just a picture show. To me, I mean, you, you tell me how to get around all this stuff. You know, this, I mean, they are trying to, as yes, you know, we're trying to figure out how to get, figure out how to get around saying that the stuff you experience here is really real. Good luck. You know, and science is against you. You know. So, yeah, it seems that life is a picture show. So, call the camera an eye. Just as much as the eye is an eye. Works with me, you know.